In the book of James, beginning in chapter 4, in verse 13, the brother of Jesus says, he says, Whereas do you know, do you not know what your, will happen tomorrow? For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. There are people here tonight that have lived quite a few years, uh, some more than others. But I think if you reflect on your own life, you know that time passes very quickly. If you remember back to when you were a child, it might have been many, many years ago, but yet it passes by very, very quickly. I know I've said this before, but when my children were born 21 years ago, I had people come and tell me, you need to take advantage of every moment because they will grow up so fast. And I thought, they're crazy. I got a long time before these kids are going to be full grown. And yet now they're legal adults. But yet when I look at them, they're still my little babies. And I think when you look at your children, you look at them still as your babies. And the fact that God has created each and every one of us and wants what is best for us, we are his children. And even though our life here on this earth vanishes away very quickly, we're here for such a short time, we have to make the very best of our lives while we're here. The Bible tells us in the book of Job, he says, man who was born of woman is of a few days and full of trouble. From the time that we enter into this world and the time that we leave this world, we'll go through many, many things in our life. Many things that are full of joy and many things that are full of sadness. But all these things will go by very, very quickly much more quickly than we ever wanted them to go. Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. If we want to have the best life, even though it vanishes away as a vapor, it's going to be the life that is keeping his commandments will help us to have the greatest temporary life that we have here in our eternal home in heaven after we leave this place. We begin our eternal life in the family of God at the point that we become in contacted with the blood of Jesus. When we come in contact with his blood through the watery grave of baptism, when we have all of our sins washed away, we come up in newness of life and we're part of his kingdom and we're part of that eternal life that he has promised us. And even though our body will, will vanish, our body that is here will decay, our body will, will become decrepit and old and, and not what it used to be. You ever talk to somebody say, how you doing? And they say, man, I, it's, it's rough. It's hard for me to get up in the morning. I have this ache. I have this pain. You hear all these things and it's just part of life. Sometimes I feel like some people are just falling apart. And I'm thankful that it hasn't happened to me yet. But I'm sure it's coming. When I get up, I have some aches and pains, but nothing that's serious. But yet I know people that it takes every bit of their power just to roll out of bed because of the pain that they have. Just from their bodies and the age that they are. Even though they lived here several years, it still vanishes away. It's like a vapor. We need to remember that we're just passing through. This home here on earth is not our eternal home. We're just here for a short time. Our eternal home is in heaven. When we receive the blessing of forgiveness of sins, we are part of that eternal home, that eternal family in heaven. And if we keep his commandments and we obey his will, then we'll have that eternal life with him in heaven. The problem that we have is the problem with sin. The thing that can keep us out of heaven is falling to the temptations of sin. If we can overcome these things, then we will definitely have that home forever with him. But we need to know and understand where these come from. Again, in James chapter 1, he says in verse 14, he says, Each one of us is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. You see, sin that we fall short, to is something that comes from within us. When you think about your age that you are now, there may be things that 
were problems with sin in the past that are no longer a problem. You have matured, you have grown, that the things of the past no longer are temptations because we are closer to God than we've ever been before. We should be. But when we do fall to temptations, when these things affect us, then these things, when they're desired from within us, when they're conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. The death he's talking about is the eternal separation from God. Not only death in this life, but death eternally away from God. And instead of being rewarded with the home in heaven, we have an eternal home in hell. Being receiving our just reward for the unforgiven sins that we have. He says in verse 16, he says, Do not be deceived, my brethren. He said, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And it comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will he brought us forth from the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. God wants us to do what is right. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. If we fall to sin, then we're not keeping his commandments. If we truly love Jesus, then we will overcome these sins. But in order to overcome these sins, it's going to take something that is learned behavior. When you think about everything that you know, when you think about all of the things that you have, uh, that make you, that shape you, uh, we are a product of our environment. We're products of our family, our friends, our family, our church. Everything that affects us shapes and molds us, even though we have the choice and we make the decision whether we are going to do what is right or what is not right. But this is something that is learned. You know, sometimes it depends on how we look at things. In life, everything will depend on how we look at it. Sometimes we can see things very clearly, and sometimes we cannot. This morning on the way to the church building, I could not see hardly at all. I was having a lot of trouble seeing. I have contacts that are called uh, daily wear, disposables. These contacts are contacts that you wear once and you, you throw them away. Well, last night while I was preparing my lesson, I was looking at some things and verses uh, to copy clip into my notes off of the Internet, and I couldn't see very good out of this eye. Now, this eye, I have monovision. If you don't know what that is, it means this eye is not the same as this one. They, I don't know how the brain does it, but it's the way God made us. This eye can see things close up, and this one sees things farther away. And my right eye is my dominant eye. So I took out one contact so I could see the screen better last night. And I forgot to take the other one out. So when I put my contacts in this morning, unknown to me, I had two contacts in this eye. And when Dennis was having trouble with the changer or didn't have the changer, couldn't find it, I went out to look for it. And on my way back, I said, you know what? I'm going to take this thing out because I just couldn't see. And when I took it out, two of them came out. So I got rid of the old one and put the, the new one back in. And I could see and let me tell you, it is a great thing. It is a blessing to be able to see. Uh, when we know people like Michelle that worships with us that can't see right, uh, it, it, is, it is something that we should be thankful for among many, many other things that God has blessed us with. But being able to see clearly is also important for us to do anything that we do. It also is important for us to see clearly in the way God wants us to see as we are his children. If we could see as God sees, we would see things maybe a little bit different. When you see things today, when you see people, we make preconceived judgments. Many times we make, uh, we have an ideal about somebody, maybe even before we even talk to them. And the reason isn't because we're just thinking bad. It's because of what we have learned, what we have seen. But until we actually see people in the way that God sees people, we're not going to be as effective as we really should be in helping to serve and helping others come to Christ. Jesus said when he talked about 
uh, the judgment day in Matthew 25, he talks about separating the goats from the sheep. And as he talks about this, he, he tells those that are listening something that is very, very important. And something I think we need to, to understand today. This begins in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 31. Jesus says, when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all of His holy angels with Him, He will sit on the throne of His glory. And He says, all the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. He will set the sheep on His right hand, but the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. And then listen to what he says. For when I was hungry, you gave me food. He says, When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was a stranger, you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous, those that are doing what is right, will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? Now these are those that say they're doing what's right. Are those who think they're righteous. He says, And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Now, they did what was right. But look what happens in verse 41. Then he will say also to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you curse it into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It's talking about hell. Those who are doing right have an eternal life in heaven. Those who are doing wrong are going to burn in hell. Look what he says in verse 42. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not take me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they will also answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Assuredly, I say unto you, inasmuch as you did this, did not do this to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. You notice both of them, the righteous and those who were not righteous, had the exact same response. And it had to do with what they saw. They are saying they didn't see Jesus in this way. They didn't see Jesus naked. They didn't see him in need of food. They didn't see him in need of clothing. They didn't see him uh, imprisoned or, or sick. And the reason they didn't see him this way is because... They were not looking at him or his brothers and sisters through heaven's eyes. You see, many, many times we see only what is right in front of us. You ever been looking for something and you just can't see it? You just look and look and look. And then somebody else can come in and boom, there it is. Oh, if it was a snake, it would have bit you. Uh, they'll say something funny. Oh, it's going to be the last place you look. Well, yeah, but I didn't see it. It's very frustrating when we can't see. But think how God must be frustrated at us when we don't see his children who need these things. Now think about this. How many times do you really see people in your community, people around here that are in need of clothing? Do we see it very much? Are there places that people can be clothed? One of the great ministries that's uh, in the Brotherhood is the uh, Disaster Relief, the Churches of Christ Disaster Relief that is out of Nashville. 
how they came down here. They go all over the, the country helping people who are in need, especially after disasters. And you can be a part of that by helping to support their work. And then they actually have another part of that that goes international all over the world, helping in areas with disasters. Now, we can see if somebody doesn't have any clothes. Can we? Can we recognize that if we see someone with no clothes? I think that would be quite obvious. Do you think maybe Jesus is talking about something even deeper, even more? Just a thought that you might think of. You see, if we look at those with God's eyes, through heaven's eyes, when there's a stranger needing shelter, one thing we might ought to consider is what kind of shelter are they in need of? They may need shelter from the sins of this world. They may need shelter from their, their friends, the influences that they have, those that are bringing them down, those that are not lifting them up. They may need shelter away from them. I know of people who have lived here and had, in their minds, had to, had to move to get away from the people that they were hanging around. And uh, I know, I know a, a, a man who's a member of the church that uh, is a, a faithful member, and he said that he can't live here. He needs to be sheltered in another place. He, you see, we need to be looking to see what type of shelter people need. Uh, it's not something always that they're being sheltered from, from the physical elements, but from the spiritual, the things that Satan is at war uh, working against us. People are constantly being bombarded by the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Sometimes we need to have shelter from that. And I think that's something that we can do if we can see through heaven's eyes. Have you ever thought about those that are naked that may not only need clothes or physical clothing, but they need, may need spiritual clothing. They need to be truly clothed with Christ. They need to be clothed with the love of their brothers and their sisters. And they need to have the fellowship uh, covering them uh, as it would be with the love that we have for each other and the love that we have for God. And most importantly, they need to be covered in the blood, the blood of Jesus, being covered in that water and having their sins washed away. When you think about the sick, uh, when, when people are sick and, and need to be visited, need to be strengthened, need to be encouraged, these are all things that are very important. But think about those who are sick of the, of the lifestyle that they're living. Or maybe they're sick of all of the problems that they have created for themselves through the consequences of sin. Some people are just sick of living because of the pain that they go through each day because of their circumstances. The healing that they need can come from Jesus, but it also can come from us seeing that they're sick, that we can actually be a healing bomb to them, that we can give them the healing love of fellowship, the love of friendship, and the love of Christ that we have for them and for Jesus. When you think about those who are in prison, I don't know if you've ever been to a prison. Have you ever been somewhere to see someone who has been incarcerated? It's not a comfortable thing. Some people are very gifted and blessed in being able to do that. I'll just give you a little report that I think is very amazing. It just, uh, I was astonished. When you think about it in the state of Louisiana, you think about the largest congregation that we have and where it may be. Uh, in Baton Rouge, there's a congregation that has over 800 people. Uh, there's congregations in other places that have several pe hundred people. But did you know that there's a congregation in the state of Louisiana that has over 2,500 members in the church? And it's in at Angola. Angola has over 2,500 members of the church that worship every first day of the week. They have seven camps that they're separated by, and every Sunday they have a service seven times. A minister will preach to them each camp from 7.30 in the morning until 5.30 in the afternoon, every Sunday, 
2,500 members of the church there. Now, many people can understand and see those that are incarcerated, but how about can we see those that have uh, imprisoned themselves, not in correctional facility bars, but behind the bars that they've created themselves, uh, the bars that they have of a life of sin or a life without God? Uh, can you imagine how lonely and how hopeless and what despair people have without God? If we can see this hopelessness, if we can see the despair that they have, we have something that is so valuable that we could share with them and help them see that they can do away with all of these things if they would turn to God. If we look at a stranger, the naked, the sick, those who are imprisoned, imprisoned through heaven's eyes, we may begin to see opportunities that we had never seen before. Now, wouldn't it be a sad thing as members of the body of Christ to appear before God on Judgment Day and have Him ask us uh, if we took care of those that were hungry and thirsty, if we gave shelter to those in need of shelter, if He asked us if we took care of those in need of clothing, naked, sick, those in prison. I can tell you, I don't want to have to answer that. I don't want to be in a position of not being able to, to know that I have obeyed what he has commanded us. Every one of us can look at people through heaven's eyes, but it's something that we have to learn. It's not something that we can just do on our own. It's something that we need to make a decision to look at people beyond what we see on the surface to look at them the way that Jesus would look at them. Now, if we can do this, then we can help many, many souls come to Christ. Now, all of us has, have been invited to different events. We've been invited to, uh, to come to the feast. We've been invited to have our sins washed away. We've been invited to come together. And tonight, as we're together, we always have an invitation when someone speaks. Uh, there's many places that do not. We believe that we want to give everyone an opportunity. You never know when somebody needs some help. You never know when somebody would like to uh, have the power of prayer that God has given to each one of us. You never know when somebody's hurting. Uh, I heard a prayer that I've heard uh, by one particular member here who has prayed for those who are hurting in silence. And to me, when I heard that the first time, I thought, how sad that is. That even though we're your brothers and your sisters, that they don't feel comfortable enough to ask for the prayers of their brothers and sisters. Well, I'm here to tell you that we love each and every one that is here. And it's important for us to take advantage of the power that God has given us. If you're in any need, you need to let us know. And tonight, as we're here, we're going to have an invitation song. We're going to ask everyone that might have any need to come and let us know so that we can pray for you. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, Take my yoke upon you, for and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. If you have any need, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. <laughs>